Well, as you see, we have three speakers this morning. They've been told to keep to 30 minutes. Uh, with a little bit of leeway from the chairman, but that will leave time for a reasonable amount of discussion, questions, and so on, which we'll take after each paper, since they cover all the different aspects of the topic. And the first is Frank Close, also from the University of Oxford, who's going to talk about Oxford physics emigres in space and time. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give a rather a historical overview because the talks that follow, I hope, will go into more detail. Certainly, I hope for your benefit, they will go into more detail than I will. Um, but uh, I have to thank Chris Dwayne Smith, but for whom many emigres I would never have known of. Um, so to start, uh, the connection between the School of Natural Philosophy in the Bodleian Quadrangle and the great giant killers from Lincoln City uh, I've noticed are sponsored by Bishop Grosseteste University and uh, it was Chris that pointed out to me that Robert Grosseteste, uh, somewhere around 1168 to 1253, um, was perhaps the first Chancellor of Oxford University and I went to the world's greatest creation scientists, which sounds a bit like Donald Trump appealing to facts, <laughs> uh, and found these items are on him, that he founded the Oxford School, led to scientific method, explained the rainbow, um, whether he did or not, we can discuss in a moment. Um, but I then, after Chris told me about him, I went and checked him out uh, on another source of absolute certainty, Wikipedia, um, and he was described as the first real physicist. This is certainly true, the greatest mind you've never heard of. Uh, and indeed, that was true for me, I'd never heard of him until that. Um, and he was a remarkable polymath. And indeed, uh, having not heard of him, and perhaps him not been spoken around in Oxford for the last 700 years, then like number 11 buses, two come along at once, that apparently yesterday's colloquium in the physics department was about Robert Grosteste. Uh, and indeed, there's a very interesting project that is going on at the moment involving Durham University and Oxford and some others, involving scientists, historians and classicists who are studying Grosteste's work, which is of course written in Latin, uh, and trying both to translate it, but with the scientific know-how, the scientific input, to assess really what it was that he did or did not do in science. Uh, he was described as the first real experimental scientist. I'll raise a question as to what that actually is. Um, his science notes, uh, well, Tom McLeish, who gave the talk yesterday, said that apparently Gross Test's uh, scientific notes were all in the Durham Library and somebody took them out in 1349 and didn't return them. <laughs> But he then added that uh, his scientific opus apparently exists in the libraries of several Oxford colleges, so perhaps we will hear more about that. So what did he do and who was he? Well, what he did, um, he, between 1200 and 1215, got interested in the nature of sound, and in his spare time he was producing ideas that led to the Magna Carta. He was obviously quite a polymath. 1220 he was interested in comets, and... Uh, in 1224, he did work on light and colour, which seems to have been the thing that led to the idea that he was the first person to make serious investigations into the nature of the, of the rainbow. Uh, I've got a question mark against experiment, and we'll see why in a moment. Uh, certainly, he believed that there was order in what he perceived as God's creation, and he posited that this being so ordered, that the universe would be explainable by observation. And I think from what I learned from yesterday's talk was that uh, experiment really meant what we would now call Gedanken experiments, by the power of logic to ask questions and find inconsistencies and make progress from there. And indeed, if you realise we're talking here around 1200, I think it's quite remarkable that the insight that he had was the following. The, the paper on light, uh, as McLeish pointed out, was really a paper on the stability of matter. And this was the thing that concerned Grosteste, that the Greek philosophy insisted that everything was made from atoms which were point-like. And it doesn't matter how many points you put together, you've still got a point. So how do you have large-scale solid matter? And this was a question he asked himself from the point of view of logic. 
His second insight was that light, however, diffuses outwards from a point into a sphere. So light can clearly propagate and is not, therefore, a point. And so he then conjectured that matter is an amalgam of atom and light. In fact, the translation of what he actually said was, whatever sustains extension in matter is either light or participates in some part in the properties of light. And, of course, now is the danger that with a 21st century wisdom, you can say, ah, oh, he was anticipating the idea that atoms are bound by electromagnetic forces, etc. Of course he wasn't. This is the danger that you can impose present knowledge on these remarks and see uh, ideas that were perhaps not there. But that is the nature of what he was doing, which is certainly remarkable in its time. Um, the question, though, is, was he an emigre? Uh, he was a member of a Norman family, which had come over here, uh, at the time of the Norman Conquest. He was born either in Sussex or Suffolk, depending on what you read. The question is whether he was educated in France or not before he came to Oxford. It's certainly clear that he left Oxford in 1209 when the schools were closed following the uh, hanging of two clerics. He went to Paris then and returned to Oxford uh, when the papal legate came and decided that the Bishop of Lincoln would oversee the appointments in the university, and Drostes became, in due course, Bishop of Lincoln, and was, in a sense, the first chancellor of the university. Whether, however, he was actually educated in France or not depends upon whether you read French literature, who like to regard him as a French philosopher, uh, or English, which has a different opinion. But be that as it may, he's in my thing, and I wasn't going to throw all the slides away at the last moment. So there he is. Uh, he lectured on cosmology, which was called theology in those days, and his basic premise was that uh, he was investigating light because God created light. Uh, well, there you are. Um, to look at a greater detail from the creation scientists list of things he did, architect of calendar revision, Magna Carta, early church reformer, mentor Ockham, Roger Bacon and others. Certainly, I mean, he was a great mind and I would actually like to see more written about him. I'm not going to be writing that for my next book, Graham, but when you finish yours you might want to pursue him. Um, well, proceeding with the world's greatest creation scientist brings us to, to Robert Boyle, um, who was Irish, and I checked with Joe, therefore does qualify as emigre in, <laughs> <laughs> in the context of this meeting. Um, they describe him as the father of chemistry, as distinct from alchemy. Uh, he insisted on experimentation for scientific proof. My impression, actually, is that he was almost an anti-theorist, in the sense that he refused even to read and study Greek philosophy so that it didn't contaminate his mind with the sort of wrong things and that he had to do experiments to, to demonstrate reality and uh, in that sense was not a theorist. He was, I suppose, the father of chemistry in that he distinguished the difference between compounds and mixtures and although this I don't suppose could be credited to say that he was the person who led to atoms, it's certainly the beginnings of the idea that uh, there are atomic elements uh, beneath everything. Uh, then, that period actually was very interesting in Oxford. was Christopher Wren as well. Robert Hooke, I just included, he came from the Isle of Wight, which is overseas. <laughs> um, I mean, he's fascinating because he seems to have anticipated sort of the world of alternative facts that we now live in, um, that he wrote his ideas in code and then claimed that he had invented them and got himself into huge disputes in the Royal Society with Luton and others. But uh, we'll move on. Um, the 17th century, uh, the Scottish emigres then appear. David Gregory, who was at the University of Edinburgh, um, he was an Episcopalian and I think it was, I'm not sure which way around it is now, the, the Presbyterians re required that Anybody working in the universities had to swear allegiance to the king, and he refused. And so he left uh, Scotland and came down to Oxford, uh, together with his student, John Keel. Now, if you're checking these people up, uh, there's a John Keel and a James Keel. James Keel was a, a biologist medic uh, in the university. John Keel, uh, his brother, uh, was the, the natural philosopher, or physicist, if you like. He was a student of Gregory. The, uh, probably the most famous things of Gregory and Keel were that they introduced the ideas of Isaac Newton 
uh, not just into Oxford, but for the very first time into the universities of Oxford and Cambridge, experimental uh, demonstrations uh, were made. Um, Keel became famous or infamous uh, in getting involved in the disputes between Newton and Leibniz, and not necessarily to his own advantage. Uh, in the course of this, uh, he made enemies, and although he was the deputy to the professor of natural philosophy, uh, he never himself was appointed to that post, even when the, the, the professor retired. Uh, so he missed that chair, and there's dispute as to the reasons why. Uh, it seems, however, the sort of social mores of the time, his choice of wife was regarded as something of a scandal. Mary Clements was a very inferior rank, being the daughter of an Oxford bookbinder. Perhaps the attraction for Keel was the fact that she was 25 years younger. <laughs> now, in the 19th century, uh, we come to three astronomers. I'll just mention their names and then go into slightly a bit more about them, what they did. Uh, Stephen Rigaud, who's a French Huguenot, who uh, was the civilian professor uh, and also the Radcliffe Observer. Uh, Warren Delarue from Guernsey and Jean-Louis Dreyer, uh, who was Danish. So just look at each of those in turn, because I'd never heard of them before. Uh, so Stephen Rigaud, uh, he was a French Huguenot. His father was director at Kew. Uh, he was a fellow at Exeter, my own college. I didn't even know that fact. His uncle was an artist, and this portrait of the young Stephen is actually in the Ashmolean Museum, painted by the uncle. Uh, he lived at 21 Richmond Green, just around the corner from Graham Farm, though, so I'm sure that Graham can answer questions <laughs> about him. <laughs> Warren Delarue from Guernsey, he was educated in Paris, and he was the son of the founder of the Delarue, the, the, the stationary people. And uh, he actually did something really genuinely scientific. Uh, in 1840, uh, he had a, an evacuated glass bulb with a little thin platinum uh, wire inside it, and he passed an electric current through, and in a sense, he made the first light bulb by doing that. Um, and he was interested uh, in the emergence of photography, and I don't know whether it was he that introduced it, but he was certainly one of the prime movers in bringing photogra photographic techniques into uh, the science of astronomy. And, uh, however, his connection with Oxford is somewhat tenuous, he donated a telescope to the University Observatory. It's the only connection I can find. I mean, why he did, uh, I don't know, but thank you for doing so. But anyway, he apparently therefore qualifies as one of us. Um, John Louis Dreyer, the Dane, uh, he went to Ireland and was an assistant to, to Lord Ross uh, of the Ross Telescope. He later became the director of the observatory at Armagh until his retirement in 1916. And then he moved to Oxford in order to research and write a history of astronomy. And this led to his 15 volumes about Tycho Brahe, the final volume being published uh, after his death. And there is a lunar crater named after him. So I think that's the only Oxford lunar crater, but maybe we're wrong. You're the experts, you're gonna tell me the reality. Um, you will hopefully, in the next talk, or later uh, resolve another minor mystery for me with coming to the 20th century. Albert Einstein, uh, seen here getting his honorary degree in 1931, um, and a picture of him with his rooms in Christchurch, picked in the Christchurch quad on the 3rd of June, 1933. Uh, there's a photograph also of his famous lecture, uh, the blackboard of which is preserved in the Museum of the History of Science, which I always think is one of Oxford's enigmas. If you arrive at the front door at any random time, it's likely not open. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the lecture he gave was in 1931, and according to the founder of All Knowledge Wikipedia, it was attended by Christchurch visitor Erwin Schrodinger. <coughs> this is the world of alternative facts. <laughs> 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 Which I think is a miracle because I think it also only arrived in 1934. <laughs> so I then decided I would do a Google search and I put in Schrodinger Christchurch. And you now then see the, both the power and the stupidity of such searches because 
Schrodinger and Christchurch links and brings you the following cartoon. <laughs> as long as the tomb is closed, Jesus is both alive and dead. <laughs> So I then did deeper research and found my original college here, Maudlin. Indeed, he was a fellow of Maudlin. Um, and I was fascinated on the same page that he wrote this uh, article or book, Do Electrons Think? To which the answer is yes, if there's enough of them. <laughs> which is one of the, I think, this is seriously, my, I think this is one of the most profound questions of all. And I think that if I was starting over again, if I was 50 years younger, the nature of consciousness and how many atoms do you have to have before they become aware of the fact that they're there is one of the most intriguing questions. But that's for the discussion session. Um, he also was a great quoter. I don't like it. I'm sorry I ever had anything to do with it. <coughs> I'm not quite sure what that refers to. <laughs> I hope it's his equation, but anyway. Um, he was also famous uh, for uh, his menage a trois. And uh, there's a beautifully coy description that I found somewhere his position at Oxford did not work out well. His unconventional domestic arrangements, sharing living quarters with two women, was not met with acceptance. <laughs> so then we move on to the, the era that uh, Graham Farmer will be talking about, um, Lindemann and the, the Jewish emigres in the 1930s. A question which Graham and I had discussed over Skype was actually whether Lindemann himself does or does not qualify as an emigre, uh, his father and family were German. His father moved to uh, Britain uh, about 20 years before Lindemann himself was born, but Lindemann himself was actually born while his mother, at least, was in Germany on holiday, and then he came back again. But be that as it may, there is no doubt that it was he that brought uh, the emigres of the 1930s in, of which we'll say more in a moment. He himself also is a person that made great quotes and also shows his rather uh, myopic view of the importance of science relative to humanities. It is more important to know the properties of chlorine than the improprieties of Claudius. So the, uh, the three uh, uh, emigres, uh, of which we'll hear more, Lindemann was responsible for encouraging to Oxford and who played uh, some of them great roles during the, the Second World War. Nick Curty on the left, Kurt Mendelssohn in the middle, uh, and Francis Simon on the right. Um, Nick Curty, uh, also uh, as a low temperature physicist, uh, became quite famous in his later life for applying the techniques of low temperatures to, to cooking. And uh, here's a great quote from him. I think it is a sad reflection on our civilization that while we can and do measure the temperature in the atmosphere of Venus, we do not know what goes on inside our soufflés. <laughs> So, uh, during the war, of course, uh, Francis Simon was very much involved in driving forward the diffusion experiments to separate uranium-235 from natural uranium, which became key, eventually, to tube alloys and the Manhattan Project. Um, I've been interested recently in researching some of this and discovered that uh, after Klaus Fuchs, the atomic spy, was arrested, they were trying, the FBI and MI5 were trying to find exactly where he lived in New York, uh, and it was Nick Curtis's diary uh, that uh, finally gave the answer. This is classified top secret. Nick Curtis's diary has Klaus Fuchs's address, 122 West 72nd Street in New York. Um, so that gives me an opportunity just to do my own midterm advert here uh, on Rudy Piles and Klaus Fuchs. Uh, Trinity is not just because of the bomb going off in the middle there, which was the code name, but father, son, and unholy ghost. This is the father of the atomic bomb, Klaus Fuchs, metaphorical son, and the director general of the unholy ghost of MI5. Um, and uh, the background to this is what we will move on to uh, in a moment. Uh, Rudy Piles, of course, at that stage was at Birmingham, um, and his assistant, Klaus Fuchs, was at Birmingham. But the two of them were regularly with uh, the group in Oxford uh, who were doing the diffusion experiments, both in the 1930s. Uh, and then later, post-war, when Klaus Fuchs was at Harwell, there was a lot of interaction with Oxford. So although we didn't pay him, I included him in the people of emigres that have had some effect. Um, and certainly he played a great role in sharing the discoveries of Francis Simon as widely as possible. <laughs> 
Um, now, the book about Lindemann by Adrian Fort, uh, which he called Prof, I recommend to you all to, to read about Lindemann, uh, his fascinating life, um, and his, his feelings about other scientists and other scientists' feelings about him. And maybe Graham will mention something of this. But uh, it's quite remarkable. You find in the files uh, of MI5 that Lindemann uh, had some pretty caustic remarks to make in his opinion about Rudy Piles, uh, which are all blacked out. It doesn't show Lindemann's name as the source of these remarks uh, until you go to other files where it refers back to these things. It's quite clear that it is Lindemann that is making them. If you want to know more, we can talk about it. But I just showed Prof because I come from a generation uh, who, many of whom are here, uh, including the chairman, who, if asked who is Prof, we almost knew Rudy Piles as, as Prof. And uh, to just those of you who didn't know him or know of him, just to show how singular he was, here uh, he is leading a conversation with Pauli uh, and Dirac. I say he's leading it because Pauli is behind them and it's statistically more likely that it's Piles that is talking than it is Dirac that is talking. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, from 1963, um, Rudy came to the department here as professor, and although Jenny, his wife, was not formally on the payroll, I think anybody who was fortunate to be here during that time realises that she really was the heart and soul of the department, and Rudy just did the physics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but among uh, people that he brought here, and uh, Tony Hay will be talking about this, uh, more was the Australian uh, Dick Dalitz, and I'll leave to Tony to tell us more about him. Um, I mean, Tony and I and Chris are all from the same generation, and I think we probably will agree that at that time, the real power base and the students in the department here were the emigres from Scotland, um, of which I recall this particular one, Mike Postlitz, who even has the eyes personally. Um, that is what he looked like last year in picking up the Nobel Prize in Stockholm. Uh, this is how I remember him, not on the left, I never knew he was an undergraduate, but as a graduate student, uh, I shared an office in 12 Parks Road with him in the second year. And uh, the thing that I remember about him most was, well, two things. He was, a, he was an avid climber. Uh, every weekend he would go off to Scotland in a little red car whose number plate ostentatiously was FRS 168 or something like that. Um, but uh, he was such a, a, an avid rock climber. And in those days we didn't have uh, laptops, you had pencil and paper. And so he would be writing with his right hand and he would be squeezing a spring in his left to keep his left wrist strengthened. And then whenever he stopped to think, he would transfer this to his right hand and be squeezing while that, and if you don't want to fall off rock faces, that's a good thing to do. But I, that's my main memory of him. And of course, as the years went by, um, more and more uh, people from outside the UK became part of at least the theoretical physics department that I show here. The 2016 theoretical physics picture, uh, if you were to identify the number of people there who were not emigres, I think you'd be talking at most 50%. Um, things certainly have changed. And of course, we now see how things, as, as science has become more international. And of course, now we have where the future goes. And I took this cartoon out of the, uh, of the Times, what I call an example of resolution. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn down the bottom there, apparently saying in, but if you look at it very carefully, it's saying out. And clearly the question of what this is going to mean for the future uh, of, of science as a whole, but the, the role of emigres in science and how we're going to proceed from here on, uh, that again I think will be talked about later. Um, but for the moment, that is my rather superficial survey and I'm hoping to learn more about it from you all as the day goes on. Thanks. leading us later into more detailed talk, but let us, let us follow up any of the things that Frank was saying. Yeah, a, a few months ago I drew your attention to an apocryphal story, I think. It said that on Robert Boyle's tomb, it says, here lies Robert Boyle, father of chemistry and uncle of the Earl of Cork. <laughs> and I was hoping you could tell us whether that turned out to be true or not. <laughs> Ah, well, I, uh, I went down to, uh, I was in London one day and I went to St. Martin's in the Fields where uh, his tomb 
stone is, or was at least, and could find no trace of it at all. And then I was directed down to the crypts to find out more. And I had this bizarre conversation with somebody, and I said, uh, I'm looking for the tombstone of Robert Boyle. And the person said to me, Shall relative? And I said, <laughs> that, no, no, I said this is Robert Boyle, the chemist. I was that since 1945? I said, no, 17th century. Ah, oh, they've all gone. <laughs> <laughs> and perhaps the records are somewhere in, in Westminster uh, Abbey archives or somewhere. But I, I haven't pursued that. But it's, I was hoping to find it, take a photograph, include it in the tour. The question is, am I working on Fuchs and the relationship? Um, with MI5. I mean, the, the, is that something which you're working on? Yes, I was, I was fascinated. I mean, after I'd been researching Bruno Pelli Corvo and discovered lots of pages in MI5 about him, um, I then started reading some of the Fuchs files and realised two things. First of all, there had been no biography of Fuchs written since papers had been released uh, to the National Archives. Um, and I also became more fascinated by the fact that when it was clear, through having cracked the Russian codes, that there had been somebody in the British mission that had passed information across to the Russians. Initially, they did not know whether it was Ruby Piles or Klaus Fuchs. And I became intrigued by the amount of time that it took them to sort out exactly who was or was not responsible. And even after Fuchs had been arrested and convicted, they still were asking questions and there was questions and pursuing Rudy. So I then became intrigued by the, the threefold relationship. I mean, the, if you like, the pun on Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Uh, the relationship between the security services and their inquiries into Fuchs and also Piles and the relationship between Piles and Fuchs as well. That's what we're trying. So, yes, that's ongoing and it'll come out with Penguin next year. Thank you for asking the question. <laughs> <laughs> as Jeremy Corbyn said in a different context. Wasn't it true that there was some woman also involved in passing these secrets to the Russians? Oh, there were many people. Uh, yes, Melissa. Mel 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 yes, yes. Uh, she was. Uh, there was a book written about her. It was the was it the grand the grandma who came for the co-op? No, the spy who came for the co-op. Oh. Well, yes. Uh, the more you dig, the more you find. You may remember that in the aftermath of that, somebody in the paper suggested that it should be Jenny Piles, Robert, who was this woman who had been a singer. And Brian Flowers wrote to the Times, I remember, and said anybody who met Jenny would realize she could never be a secret agent. <laughs> <laughs> she was too indiscreet. <laughs> Your list of uh, Charles emigrants doesn't include uh, Hans Halbert. You see him as Hans. Oh, yes. Uh, I mean, there are, I'm sure there are many that uh, I that I haven't mentioned, and I hope will get mentioned along the way. But yes, Hans Halbert, of course, migrated in a hurry from France with the heavy water. I went to Cambridge. Was she actually in the department? She was in the department in Oxford, I think, after the war. After the war, yes. Right. Yes, I mean, the area was called Halbania, was it? Yes. Well, there we are. But, but he went back to Paris, so in a sense, he was not formally. I mean, the definition of an emigre is someone who settles in another country, as I understand. Highly approved was. And highly approved certainly was, yes. I mean, the definition that I use in immigration yeah, is yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, for that. Yeah, I also wanted to mention Fritz London, who, yeah. who is, I think, an important member of this, uh, this team of emigrants who came over in the early 30s. I think he often gets written out of Oxford histories because uh, Lindemann got rid of him in, in 36. He was running out of money. Uh, a lot of the support, financial support for the emigrants came from ICI and Grant finished, and he had to get rid of somebody. And London had written this paper with his brother, uh, which later on revolutionised the field of superconductivity. Mm. Bardeen, when he was collecting the second Nobel Prize, said it was the, it was the crucial thing that set Bardeen and Cooper and Shreve on their way to their full theory. But I think nobody in Oxford really understood it. And uh, Fritz London gave lectures in the maths department with a very heavy German accent, and the students didn't like it. So I think when Lindemann was looking for somebody to get rid of, Fritz London went. 
you remember where he went? To Liverpool? Yeah, he went to Paris. So, um, but he was only there from 36 to 39, and then he had to get out because, uh, because Germany invaded France, and uh, he ended up in the United States in June. Please. I've heard it said that at one point Emmons was considered uh, for a possible chair at Oxford and that uh, it was dropped on the grounds that there was already a German at Oxford and this was the person who made the objection was it actually German, the professor of German. Do you know anything about this? No, no. Has anyone here heard anything about this? I think it's certainly true. <laughs> it is. And, and the great irony is that instead of appointing Helmholtz, they appointed Fitler. Oh, that was good. Well, of course, you've all heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is Willis Lamb coming up today? Well, of course, he wasn't a Lemmingra. I mean, he was, a, he was a temporary visitor, in a sense. He was here for, what, four years, five years? He went back to America, where he came from. I see. It was very important that he was here, sir. Given Frank's flexible definitions of his yeah. and uh, his uh, considerable distinction, it's worth a mention. It is indeed. Somebody else who was considered for the chair here is Vice Cop, right? Yeah. 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 Peter and Vice Cop from Pilots came through. My father was at Manchester, he actually hired two of them. Uh, of birds of passage. Uh, they, they were very much young guys in the mix. And uh, they were all considered, they were all regard, recognized as extremely smart. And of course, two of them ended up in the States and one ended up in Birmingham. Well, I think we're running out of steam temporarily, I think. So perhaps, Frank, thank you.